discuss the uh, quality assurance framework for uh, higher education in the Philippines. So the framework would uh, be applicable to the entire tertiary private education sector as well as to individual schools. Uh, so uh, the Commission on Higher Education is now implementing what is known as a typology and outcomes based uh, quality assurance framework. In this uh, framework, basically, the schools will be typed or the schools will choose their own type. Uh, this is the so-called horizontal typing. So they may want to be called a university, professional institute, or a college. This is about as simple as you could make it. In other countries, this is more uh, complicated than this. And then uh, within each uh, type, within each horizontal type, uh, the chair, uh, also with the help of the accreditation bodies, uh, will do uh, vertical typing. You can say a school will either be classified as autonomous, deregulated, or regulated. And uh, then the chair and the accreditation agencies employ outcomes-based accreditation system for regular monitoring and updating of the status of these of the, uh, of the various schools. Okay. Um, so for horizontal equality, the HEIs would be differentiated functionally along, uh, along the lines of the qualifications and corresponding competencies of their graduates. Student outcomes. So an engineering, a professional engineer may be different from an engineering technologist or an engineering technician. Learning companies outcomes and uh, what are sometimes called also graduate attributes in the Commonwealth countries. And uh, the nature of the degree programs, the qualification of faculty members, the types of available learning resources and support structures available, and the nature of linkages and community outreach programs of the schools. So universities will be defined operationally as follows. So university must at least must have at least 20 academic degree programs with enrollees, at least six of which are at the graduate level. The presence of graduate students manifest the training of experts will be involved in professional practice and the discovery of new knowledge. We also must have at least one doctoral program in three different fields of study. And then all graduate programs and at least 50% of baccalaureate programs must require the submission of a thesis project or research paper. There should be a core of permanent faculty members, all full-time faculty members and researchers have at least relevant master's degrees. And uh, all faculty members teaching doctoral programs, which have doctoral degrees, of course, and uh, they must all have professional license. And then at least 30 full-time faculty members or 20% of all full-time faculty are actively involved in research. So, you know, sometimes you really have to have some numbers in all these criteria. But the idea here is uh, the universities must be doing research, the discovery research. That is, they must be able to generate new knowledge. And uh, any one of the two conditions, annual research cost, annual research cost uh, for the past five years must be equivalent to at least 75,000 pesos per the number of faculty members involved in research. So we just did some simulation, look at the data, and we thought that this might be the most uh, rational a reasonable way of uh, putting the criterion. At least 5% of full-time faculty members must have patents, articles in refereed journals, or books published by reputable presses, presses in the last 10 years. Okay. And they must have resources and linkages appropriate to uh, doing research work. Okay. Now let me go to professional institutions. Professional institutions must at least have 70% of their enrollment in degree programs in the various professional areas. And 60% of the academic degree programs offerings must be in various professional areas. So the first one in the first enrollment, the next uh, criteria refers to the academic degree programs themselves. And uh, there should be four faculty members with at least 50% full time having relevant degrees and professional licenses. And uh, resources and linkages must be appropriate to professional training institutions. Uh, and lastly, colleges. Uh, the schools must have a core curriculum, or 70% of the undergraduate programs must have a core curriculum that develops thinking, problem solving, decision making, 
communication, technical, and social skills. And the core of, permanently, of permanent faculty members must have at least 50% among them uh, with relevant graduate, uh, graduate degrees in the subjects that they handle. I think the uh, distinction here is uh, the core of the curriculum will be thinking, problem solving, decision making, communication, technical, and social skills. Uh, these are required also of the other types of schools, but this will not be uh, uh, very central to the, uh, uh, the core of the curriculum itself. They are there, but uh, there are other items there as well. And learning resources and outreach, pro outreach programs must be appropriate to, uh, to, uh, to that type. Okay. If uh, the, the chat uh, did this, uh, they wanted to respond to types because in the present situation, everybody wants to become a university. Everybody wants to have that label. And uh, one of the requirements is research. So uh, just to qualify, uh, you see all sorts of research coming up and, uh, you know, and in our case, for example, we, the Mokou Institute of Technology basically trains professionals. Uh, sometimes we ask ourselves the questions, if we have so much, so much resources, where should we put it? Should we put it in research or should we put it in instructional laboratories where we can train better professionals? So for uh, the optimal use of resources of individual schools as well as uh, at the sectoral level, we thought that uh, the typing of schools along horizontal lines would uh, serve, the, serve the country. But we realized that uh, as of now, uh, many schools are far from where they really want to be. So we've adopted a moving targets approach. So by 2014, we have certain criteria. By 2017, we'll stretch it out some more, no? so the schools can reach for higher, higher standards. Okay. Now within each type of uh, school, there will be vertical uh, typology. Uh, basically, a uh, uh, ranking of schools. And uh, there will be uh, two areas where the schools will be assessed and evaluated. So this is already part of the monitoring and evaluation process that will happen in the higher education sector. The first criterion will be commitment to program excellence. By program, we mean academic degree program. And the second uh, criterion will be uh, will be concerned with institutional sustainability and enhancement. Okay. So pre program excellence will be manifested through accreditation. It will be done by non-government organizations. And then we'll count centers of ex excellence and development. Uh, these are uh, uh, titles that are conferred by the Commission on Higher Education. And we look at international certification of the, of the schools. For institutional quality, uh, this will be manifested through institutional accreditation and evaluation using an instrument called the Institutional Sustainability Assessment. This, use, this will be a revised version of the existing Institutional Quality Assurance through monitoring and evaluation instrument, or what we call the WAMI. And then other evidences in the areas of governance and so on, and uh, the institutionalization and implementation of systems and processes. So there are three types of HEIs according to vertical classification. So there are three horizontal types. So you may be a university that's autonomous, regulated, or deregulated. You may be a professional institute, likewise, autonomous, deregulated, or regulated, and college, autonomous, regulated, and deregulated. So by autonomous, we mean in a qualitative way, the schools that can demonstrate exceptional institutional quality an enhancement through internal quality assurance systems and demonstrate excellent program outcomes through a high proportion of accredited programs, presence of centers of excellence and or development and or international certification. Uh, they must show evidence of outstanding performance consistent with their horizontal type. Research and publication in the case of universities, creative work and, rele and relevant extension programs for colleges and employability of graduates or linkages in the case of professional institutes. So the regulated pretty much the same uh, phrasing, except that instead of excellent, we, we excellent, we use very good. Uh, and there will be some numbers in this later on to quantify. And the regulated are actually the category that's neither of the two. They're not autonomous or the regulated, then you, you get into that category of a regulated 
higher education institution. So we, we put in some numbers and uh, program excellence will account for a maximum of 70 points and institutional quality 30 points. So you're autonomous if your score is greater than or equal to 80, regulated if greater than or less than 65, or greater than or equal to 65 and less than 80, and regulated if your score is less than 65. <coughs> so we really have to work with numbers, as you can imagine when we do something like this to uh, make the system fair and uh, understandable to the uh, various schools. Okay, so for uh, commitment to excellence, for program excellence, uh, this is how we put in the points. Center of excellence will be 10 points. If you have a program that's considered center of excellence, according to CHED, you get 10 points. If it's a center of development, you get five points. You're awarded a maximum of 60 points for this. Local accreditation, we have a formula for that. International accreditation, you can have 10 points per internationally accredited program and 10 points per internationally certified program. As in, I, as in uh, uh, you know, certain uh, areas, you have international certification. So none of these, none of these can, uh, items can uh, generate 70 points. So you actually have to show uh, some points in at least two areas so you can get to a maximum of 70 points. Okay. Well, this is, well, we just put in some points for local accreditation. Uh, and uh, this is how it goes, actually. Uh, there will be a proportion of accredited programs. Uh, this is in relation to total number of programs that are covered by accreditation. So there are programs that are still not, where there are no instruments for accreditation, so you don't count that, so, so everything will be fair. And level of accreditation, right now, the various accrediting bodies uh, give uh, four levels, one, two, three, and four, according to your uh, to the achievements of the school. And then uh, we may differentiate between undergraduate and graduate programs. Anyway, this is how the equation looks like. So your total accreditation score is undergraduate accreditation plus graduate accreditation. And the graduate accreditation is Number of uh, okay. So here, uh, UG4 is number of uh, programs accredited at level four divided by the number of accreditable undergraduate programs. Multiplier if your level four is one point two five. Level three, you have one one as multiplier. Level two is point seven five. Level one at point five. And you multiply that with the weight. The weight is what you want to assign to for the percentage of undergraduate program enrollment. Okay. So this is for the points for undergraduate education. For graduate, it's basically the same program, but you'll have a different weight for uh, graduate education. Then you add the two up to get your score for accreditation. Okay. So uh, we also did some simulation, and we think the numbers would, uh, would be reasonable. Okay, now for institutional sustainability and enhancement. Uh, okay, this is the point system, maximum of 30 points. Uh, institutional accreditation, if uh, this is based on program accreditation, you get 25 points. If this is uh, uh, using the instrument for type-based institutional accreditation, uh, this, the, this is being done now by accreditation bodies, but we'll have to align the points in accordance with the instrument to be formulated by CHED, which is the Institutional Sustainability Assessment Instrument. So you can get 30 points for this. Uh, and then this is the old uh, EQUAME, monitoring and, and monitoring and Evaluation Instrument. Uh, there are two categories of schools here, teaching and research. So if you have category A, you have 30 points, category B, 25 points. And uh, this is uh, also the revised requirement now. And uh, this is ISO. And these are additional points that the school may gain in the various areas of governance, maintenance, quality of teaching and learning, and so on. Okay. And uh, so as uh, so was mentioned earlier, uh, we are autonomous by evaluation. We are emphasizing by evaluation because one of the issues in the Philippines is 
uh, state universities and colleges get to be autonomous without benefit of evaluation. So we're saying this is you are autonomous by evaluation. But uh, this will apply also to university, state universities and colleges. No? So if they'll have themselves subjected to this kind of uh, monitoring and evaluation, uh, then they can uh, get the uh, uh, status of uh, autonomous by evaluation. Sorry, these are very small uh, print, uh, font. But uh, the, the one point here is that uh, we're changing the criteria from 2014 to 2017 on the basis of a moving target approach. Okay. Uh, so that's the uh, that's what's going to happen in the uh, higher education sector in the years to come. Uh, schools will be tied horizontally, and they'll be evaluated later on, monitored and reevaluated uh, based on uh, horizontal type specific. Uh, instruments uh, so that they can be classified as either autonomous, regulated, or regulated. And the long-term goal is to have the majority of higher education institutions progressively improving the level of attainment of the desired program student learning outcomes through outcomes-based accreditation and evaluation, and implementing an established internal quality assurance system, and undergoing institutional assessment, preferably using a standard type-based instrument such as ISA, this can be used by both the accrediting bodies and the, and the chair. Uh, so, uh, in the context of uh, the uh, of the uh, this conference here, both the outcomes-based accreditation system and the ISA are the tools will be the tools of monitoring and evaluation in higher education. Where where is chair now? Well, the CMO on outcomes and equality-based quality. -based quality framework is done with the hearings just concluded and about to be issues and the uh, implementing rules and regulations have been drafted and then the outcomes based curricula and related matters are about to be formulated by the chef's technical panels the uh, deadline is about mid of 2013 and the isa instrument and outcomes based accreditation i think within the month we'll be holding uh, dialogues with the various accreditation bodies by the way, the uh, new curricula of CHED will be already uh, harmonized with K-12. So you'll find that the new curricula when it's rolled out either in 2016 or 2018 will be uh, compliant with the requirements of uh, K-12. Okay. Um, so the... Uh, Regarding outcomes-based accreditation, uh, this is the assessment and evaluation uh, uh, methods or paradigm that will be implemented. This is a shift from the present paradigm uh, where accreditation is mostly input-based. Uh, mostly it's been counting. How many books that are no older than five years old do you have? How many MS, PhD in the faculty? how many students per laboratory bench, and so on and so forth. Uh, the accreditation now will be somewhat different. Uh, the schools will declare what are known as student outcomes or graduate attributes or learning competencies. Uh, and uh, the school will be gauged depending upon the level of attainment of these student outcomes or graduate attributes. It's not so much what you have, but what the school is able to do, but uh, with what it has, no? uh, so there will be a shift in uh, in uh, the accreditation of uh, programs of individual schools. Uh, well, in the, the field of engineering, specifically and computing, uh, there is a Washington Accord, so called, uh, that establishes the equivalency of accreditation systems. And in Europe, you have the EURACE, or the European Network of Accreditation in Engineering Education, or NAE, that also have established uh, outcomes-based uh, accreditation as a standard for 29 or 30 countries in the whole of Europe. Uh, okay. So uh, the US-based Accreditation Board for Engineering and Technology, or ABEF, itself is managing the shift gradually. So they started in the, the third of the century, and they have, what they've done is mainly added new criteria to existing criteria for 
evaluating programs of schools, namely uh, a criteria for program education objectives, another one for student outcomes, and another one for continuous quality improvement. And uh, this is how it will look like if you're, if you're an accreditor looking at a school, you have to assess a school based on their program educational objectives, student outcomes, students, faculty and support staff, curriculum, facilities and learning environment, leadership and institutional support, industry academic linkages, and the continuous quality improvement system within the within the school. Okay. So uh, the schools will now uh, will now have to establish so we're going now into the realm of individual schools, so individual programs. So programs establish their pro, uh, educational objectives that are consistent with the mission and vision of the institution. This must be well documented and published and must reflect the particular field of practice and associated area of specialization. So a uh, program educational objective may be something like, uh, you know, you want to see your graduate several years after graduation, being able to practice the profession uh, successfully uh, uh, with regard to social and environmental concerns are able to make the decisions in the uh, with, with such uh, uh, in such a framework. And then, uh, but that would be uh, rather difficult to assess, but uh, what is closer to home would be whether a school is able to attain student outcomes or not. By student outcomes, we mean the ability of students at the time of graduation. So uh, this is an example of student outcomes which I lifted from, uh, from the ABET. Uh, for example, in engineering, an engineer must have the ability to apply knowledge of math, science, and applied sciences, the ability to design and conduct experiments, as well as to analyze and interpret data, the ability to formulate or design a system, process, or program to meet desired needs, the ability to function on multidisciplinary teams, the ability to identify and solve applied science problems, an understanding of professional and ethical responsibility, an ability to communicate effectively, the broad education necessary to understand the impact of solutions in a global and societal context, a recognition of the need for an ability to engage in lifelong learning, a knowledge of contemporary issues, an ability to use the techniques, skills, and modern scientific and technical tools necessary for professional practice. These student outcomes have actually been adopted by the Washington Accord. So these are the outcomes that the other members are shooting for, like Ireland, South Africa, UK, Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Korea, Japan, Malaysia, Singapore. These are the student outcomes that you know, the, the various schools in these countries have established for their engineering programs. If they wanted to remain members of Washington Accord, if they wanted to have mobility, global mobility later on when they uh, practice their profession. The school may, of course, add to these outcomes depending upon its own needs or inclinations. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, together with the uh, well, the establishment of these outcomes, actually, one of the basis for this is the uh, the attempt to enhance the mobility of uh, professionals uh, across national boundaries. Uh, in the particular field of engineering, there are what are known as international registers of engineers, where an, indi uh, where an individual engineer can apply for admission, for membership. Uh, but there has to be a way by which the, uh, the qualifications of the practicing engineer may, can be assessed, uh, whether it's up to international standards or not. So they have a way of doing that. You can qualify after seven years or so of practicing engineering. But they have coupled this with an academic eligibility requirement. So they now say that you must have been graduated from a program that has been accredited under the terms of Washington Accord. And in a number of years, under the terms of QRAs, the European system. Uh, so in this manner, the practice and the education in engineering have been uh, tied up. No? They've been uh, linked together uh, so that uh, uh, the accreditation of schools and qualification into international registers of engineers have been, uh, the relationship between the two uh, has been very well defined. Uh, okay. Now, the, 
a continuous quality improvement system within uh, a higher in education institution uh, becomes part and parcel of uh, an outcomes-based system. There's a lot of theory about outcomes-based, which I will not get into. Pedagogical uh, justifications and so on and so forth. But the thing here is, uh, how can you how can you compare qualifications of new graduates from schools if you don't phrase it in terms of student outcomes? Okay, so for global mobility, we all can understand each other if uh, if uh, you know the qualifications of graduates are expressed in these terms. So it happens that uh, if you do this, if you're able to state the learning outcomes very clearly, it allows its, uh, uh, that system allows itself for the, the uh, implementation of a rational qual continuous quality improvement system. So if you can assess reliably whether you're attaining the student outcomes or not, if you're able to identify the areas where your students or your graduates are strong and where they're weak, then that's the feedback. So in the next cycle, you can improve your curriculum to remedy those weaknesses and get a higher level of attainment of student outcomes. In management, maybe you call it management by objectives. Huh? But you set the outcomes and you build a CQI system on around such an outcomes-based education system. The, of the criteria, criteria, criteria or criterion. You have to establish a, a rubric. Okay. And uh, assessment would be the collection and analysis of data that can be used to evaluate achievement. Evaluation is the uh, review of the results of data collection and analysis. So you make these uh, fine distinctions between assessment and evaluation. And people tend to interchange the use of both terms. So, so uh, you know, as academics, we have to be very clear about what the difference between the two and the relation between the two terms are. Okay. So example, program educational objective, the graduates will exhibit effective communication skills. So, so this will be, um, you know, uh, years after graduation, you expect your graduates to be able to communicate effectively. But at the time of graduation, uh, what outcome are you looking for? Or outcomes are you looking for? So this, the graduate must be able to demonstrate effective written communication skills and demonstrate effective oral communications. But how do you how do you measure whether they're able to demonstrate both or either? We must have performance criteria or indicators. Let's say for written communication skills, you, you can list down that the student provides adequate detail to support his or solution or argument. He uses language and appropriate word choice for the audience. He uh, demonstrates an organizational pattern that is logical and, or the work demonstrates an organizational pattern that is both logical and conveys completeness. And the student uses the results, the rules rather, of standard, standard English. This uh, performance criteria, this four performance criteria, you can measure. You can measure. Uh, okay. So uh, how do you measure it? Uh, there are a number of ways. Uh, first, there's direct assessment. You give exams, pieces, demonstrations. You ask for reports. Provide for direct examination or observation of student knowledge or skills against measurable learning outcomes. Provide a sampling of what students know and, and or can do. And provide strong evidence of student learning. However, not all learning can be measured in a direct way. So, for example, desired outcome of a course may be to create more positive student attitudes towards mathematics. Well, we like this so much, the <laughs> in engineering, or writing or teamwork, which are difficult to assess using direct methods. So how do you measure attitudes? Uh, so you should have uh, indirect, uh, indirect assessment, uh, okay, to ascertain, ascertain the perceived, perceived extent of or value of learning experiences Assess opinions or thoughts about student knowledge and skills, and so on and so forth. You can actually conduct surveys and, uh, uh, you know, ask students to evaluate themselves and so on. And uh, normally a school would use both methods, direct and indirect, to be able to have a feel for whether the student outcomes have been uh, achieved or attained or not. 
And uh, if, if uh, actually beyond that, you can actually able, be able to, uh, to make it more granular and take a look at where the students are weak and where they're strong. Okay. So these are the methods as uh, categorized as direct or indirect. Okay. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, we all went through it. We were given a single grade when you go through a class, diva. Right? Some pass fail. Sometimes it's a uh, one, two, three, four, five. In the case of LaSalle, four, three, two, one. <laughs> uh, but uh, so the, the question sometimes is, is a single uh, number able to capture the attainment of outcome? Of course it does not. So uh, now, Actually, outcomes-based education put a lot more onus on the faculty member. You must be able to assess beyond, the, beyond the giving a single number for a grade just, uh, for the student. So at the program level or at the course level, the faculty member must be able to identify, uh, you know, the, in particular, the strengths and weaknesses of the students. That's where the rubrics uh, come in. And, uh, 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 you can have uh, you know a table like this. I think this is with regards to uh, uh, to English communication skills, no? So you can test the student for content, organization, and style, and uh, you can specify you can specify how we will get a grade of one, which is below expectations, two, progressing to criteria, three meets criteria, four exceeds criteria. So this is more like a GLSE type of rating. One to four. Okay. Uh, so here, uh, okay. So just as an example, let us say uh, exceeds criteria for content, provides ample supporting details to support solution argument. Below expectations, inconsistent or few details that may interfere with the meaning of the text. So this is something that the teacher can uh, actually do. Uh, grade a student for content, organization, organization and style. Um, so this is uh, assessment at the program level, but uh, in our case, uh, uh, well, for, forgive me for saying it, but we've had our programs, 10 of our programs accredited under AVET, and they came over and took a look, and uh, we've had to do this actually for all, all the uh, courses, we've had to, uh, to change our syllabi for all courses, we have to develop indirect and direct measures. And beyond that, we must be able to sum everything up so that when we're looking at a particular program, does the program, uh, is the program good enough to attain the outcomes that we said we would? Then you'll have to be able to bring in all the data, all these two bricks, to produce uh, some sort of uh, grade for the program. Okay, not a single numeral, but, uh, but a grade according to rubric. And there was such a volume of data that we had to, of course, deploy IT to be able to uh, to manage uh, the sheer volume of data coming in from our faculty member. You must know we have about 10,000 students in engineering. So that's the, uh, that's the extent of uh, processing of data that we've had to go through. Okay. So you can graph all the results this way. We can actually tell where, this, where your class is uh, good at or not good at, uh, you know, uh, in this case, I guess it's, uh, some people exceed the criteria, most of them address the criteria, but there are those who are lagging behind. Okay, okay so classroom and program assessment, uh, that's different. Okay. Um, so, if uh, this is uh, if this is what the entire higher education system is going through in the coming years, this is, as you can imagine, a lot of work for the various schools, as well as for the accrediting agencies. So even the uh, accreditors will have to be retrained in the manner of monitoring and assessment. They will have to learn an outcomes-based approach to accreditation. And uh, there may be some subjective aspects of it, some simply bin counting, but we believe that that is a more uh, a more useful form of evaluating and assessing the various higher education institutions. Okay. Uh, 
So for outcomes-based education, uh, we're expecting the schools to go through the process of developing program educational objectives, developing student outcomes, identifying a limited limited number of performance indicator indicators rather for its outcome, the alignment of curriculum with large learning outcomes or curriculum mapping, developing learner-centered systems to deliver the curriculum, classroom assessment and program review systems, evaluation of strengths, weakness, weaknesses, and effectiveness, and use of evaluation data to make improvements in curriculum, classroom strategies, program educational objectives, and uh, student outcomes. Uh, we found ourselves, uh, well, we spent quite a significant amount in accreditation, and half of it was in revising the uh, curriculum freeing up faculty members to be able to do work on the curriculum. So we actually deloaded them, and they got paid for working on their syllabi. So this is the, uh, in graphical form, uh, I attribute this to, Dr. Uh, to Gloria Rogers, uh, who helped us uh, develop our CQI. Uh, so uh, graphically, uh, this is CQI and uh, outcomes based. Uh, so you can start with your educational objectives, which must be formulated in uh, consultation with constituents, of course, and also periodically assessed and evaluated. So even this may be subject to improvement. And it must be consistent with the institution's mission and will be related to the learning or student outcomes. The outcomes should give rise to measurable performance criteria. And uh, with that, you're able to design your educational practices and strategies, and you go to assessment, collection and analysis of evidence, evaluation, sorry, uh, the uh, interpretation of the evidence so gathered, and this all feedbacks to a uh, continuous quality improvement uh, system. Uh, so this, there's the feedback <coughs> system that is involved. Okay. Okay. This is details on uh, the institutional sustainability assessment. I've just shown that this is uh, involved in governance and management, quality of teaching and learning, quality of professional exposure, research and creative work, uh, support for students, relations with the community, and so on. And we've indicated where this institutional sustainability assist assessment should be uh, the level of relevance to the various types of schools, either university, college, or professional institutions. Whether they're poor, they're required, or uh, uh, you know, just an indicator. Okay. So, if uh, summing up, uh, this is just my attempt to uh, relate everything to the uh, theme of the conference. Uh, so, we have here uh, the schools being typed as either universities, professional institutes, or colleges. Uh, in the coming months and years, uh, they will all be expected to come up with outcomes-based uh, education and continuous, have continuous quality improvement systems. Uh, they will also be evaluated using an instrument that's, uh, uh, that measures the, uh, how the institute is able to maintain its level of quality, the ISA. There will be monitoring and evaluation in the years to come. And uh, we're doing this for a more rational deployment of government resources, as well as for deployment of resources of individual schools. Uh, so hopefully, we all get the outcomes that we want. And the outcomes will be tied up with uh, what the country needs in terms of economic development. What sort of uh, professionals we need. Uh, that can be inputted into the outcomes, inside outcomes for the individual programs. Uh, and uh, hopefully, uh, we're able, as a sector, and also for individual schools, we're able to improve uh, performance with the continuous quality improvement system. And with such a system, I think there will be clear <coughs> accountability as to who will enhance the strengths and who will address the weaknesses sectorally and even in individual schools. So all of these are uh, in the service of community and industry. It's been involved, I guess, in the coming months and years, uh, your must job, you know, to do all of this. But this would be the uh, sea change in higher education that you might see in the, in the years to come.
Thank you.